Well, I welcome everyone that came today to the lecture series in Baha'i Studies. It is uh, extremely a uh, great privilege to have uh, one of the most pro uh, prominent scholars of uh, Baha'i Studies here with us, Dr. Jan Momen, who was born in Iran but was raised and educated in England, attending the University of Cambridge. He is a retired medical doctor and has a specific special interest in the study of Baha'i faith and Shi'i Islam, both from the viewpoint of their history and their doctrines. In recent years, his interests have extended to the study of the phenomena of religion. His principal publications in this field include Introduction to Shi'i Islam, 1985, The Babi and Baha'i Faith, 1844-1944, some contemporary Western accounts, 1982, and the phenomena of religion in 1999, which was reprinted uh, as uh, Understanding Religion in 2008. He has contributed articles to the Encyclopedia Iranica and Encyclopedia of the Modern Islamic World, as well as papers to academic journals such as the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Past and Present, Iran, and Religion. He is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society and a member of the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies, the Society of Iranian Studies, the British Association for the Study of Religion, and the Association for Baha'i Studies. Um, Dr. Mujan wa uh, Momen was kind enough to, uh, uh, to propose us, to offer us this uh, lecture who is uh, on the, who was a Baha'i in the upper echelons of the Qajar Iran which are well, most eager to hear what he has to say. It. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think I'll probably stand at this point. Actually, if I sit here, it's... I'm not in Whatever the, you're comfortable. I'm not in the way of that, am I? No. Okay. In that case, I'll sit. Um, This paper is about the question of ha people having multiple religious identities. And um, multiple religious identities can be of various sorts. Um, for example, some people, some cultures, um, such as uh, China and Japan, it's very normal for people to have several different religious identities. You can be um, married as a uh, um, a Christian and then have your funeral rites according to traditional Chinese or Japanese rituals. Um, so that in that type of culture multiple religious identities is quite normal. There's also a related type of multiple religious identities where uh, for example in sort of new age type religions where people pick and mix different uh, identities they can dabble in Buddhist meditation, the Kabbalah, and participate in pagan rites without any uh, problems, as it were. But the type of multiple religious identities that we're going to be dealing with in this paper is the type that's brought about because of persecution, religious persecution, uh, where one identity is being concealed behind another identity because uh, the real identity of the uh, re real religious identity of a person cannot be exposed because of persecution and this type of uh, this type of multiple religious identity includes for example Christians who took on an atheist identity during Stalin's campaigns against um, religion in in um, uh, Russia and uh, in Iran you have the uh, example of um, Jews who under threat of de death converted to Islam in Mashhad for example um, it's this third type of religious identity that we're going to talk about in relation to uh, the Baha'i community and um, I don't think it's news to any of you that the Baha'i community was quite severely persecuted in Iran right from the time it, of its start up to the present day but the time we're looking at Qajar period uh, this perse persecution was going on and there was not apart from a few villages and small towns there was no circumstances in which a person could openly identify themselves 
as a Baha'i. Um, there was no, if you like, social location for a Baha'i community to exist. Uh, and so therefore, since in traditional societies people are forced to have some sort of an identity, social identity, uh, by and large people maintain the identity of the religious community from which they came. So Baha'is who came, who had previously come from an Islamic, from a Shi'i background, maintained a, an outward identity of being Shi'is. Although the Shi'i practice of Tahrir, which is dissimulation of one's beliefs if, uh, if one is in danger, was not allowed in the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah did urge prudence. And the difference between the two is that the prudence means uh, this hekmat that Baha'u'llah talked about means not um, not having not going out of one's way to advertise one's religious identity in other words maintaining whatever practices this are the norms for that society but if one is pressed and one is uh, sort of as it were asked to deny one's religious identity then one should not do so as a Baha'i so that was the stand that Baha'u'llah advocated and which most Baha'is followed, although not all. Um, and this, um, this uh, type of thing was quite usual uh, that Baha'is would be suspected of being Baha'is. They would come up in front of a religious judge or the governor and um, one let out that the Baha'is had was that all through the 19th and early 20th century they were universally known as Barbies so the governor would say are you a Barbie and they would say no I'm not that's that was okay because they weren't they considered themselves Baha'is but after a couple of decades the the authorities got wise to this ploy and they started saying after they'd asked are you a Barbie and, he's, and the person said no they started asking you to curse the Barb and Baha'u'llah and the one who lives in Cyprus, just in case you're the other type of um, uh, Barbie. Um, and uh, this, the Baha'is would generally not do, and this led on to other stratagems being developed, but we're not dealing with that in this paper, so I won't um, go on into that subject. Now, questions of ide religious identity are complicated enough under normal circumstances, but um, in this sort of situation where you've got religious persecution it's it gets more complicated and it's even more complicated if a person is in the upper strata of society because people at the lower strata of society if they're being heavily persecuted they can just up sticks and move to another town I mean it's not the easiest thing to do in the world but it can be done and you just start again in another town but if you're a well-known person that's that that pathway is blocked to you so they had to be even more careful than the average Baha'i about exposing their identity. And then this, of course, brings us into problems when we're trying to identify, well, who was a Baha'i um, in those times? Because some Baha'i families went to very great lengths to conceal the fact that they were Baha'is um, because of the inevitable persecution and, and problems that this would uh, cause. Uh, for example, the Afnans were a, a f prominent family in Shiraz and Yazd, a merchant family, and they would go as far as to sponsor a Rosa Khani and sponsor Dastes during the Muharram commemorations. These are the processions, religious processions, uh, as part of their falling in with the norms of the society because that a wealthy merchant family would be expected to do that. And um, children growing up in Baha'i families in the upper strata of society sometimes never even heard the name Baha'i spoken at home in case one of the servants should hear and later make trouble for the family. So we have several examples of, of very prominent people who were Baha'is but even their children didn't know that they were Baha'is. Um, one of, I've given two examples up there, one's a Mujtahed and the other is a prominent um, uh, person in the uh, governing circles in Tehran. Um, so the question is when we're dealing with these people in the upper echelons of society how do we determine who was a Baha'i because you can't go by whether the person was accused of being a Baha'i or not because regularly people were accused of being Baha'is 
by their enemies. It was a standard ploy. You had someone who you were, who was an enemy. You accused them of being a Baha'i. This caused them trouble, and you somehow got the upper hand over them. So that's not a. Or you owed them money. <laughs> well, or you owed them money. Yes, that's right. So you know that's although one can go by that as as a guide, it's not an infallible guide because lots of people were being accused of being Baha'is. Um, you can um, not also go by whether the person themselves said they were a Baha'i or not because again they <coughs> might very well conceal the fact that they were Baha'is. Um, so what are the criteria for identifying someone in the upper echelons of society as a Baha'i? And I'm proposing five criteria and in fact none of them are infallible criteria but we'll just go through them quickly. One is that those identified in Baha'i histories as a Baha'i which is usually a good source of identification but again this might be contested for example the leading Shi'i cleric of the 1880s Mirza Shirazi is identified in one Baha'i source as a secret Baha'i but such an identification is open to challenge since he never openly declared himself to be a Baha'i and the Baha'i identity of, another, of several other prominent clerics has also been challenged. Then there are those who are identified in Muslim and other sources, European, Jewish and Zoroastrian sources, as Baha'is. But again, such identifications are open to challenge, as I said, for, for a start, because individuals might be identified as Baha'is as a way of discrediting, discrediting them. In fact, uh, one historian, Nazim al Islam Kermani, stated, It has become the norm in Iran that whenever it's desired to overthrow someone and remove them from the political scene, they say that he is a, Baha a Babi. So, a simple identification of a person as a Baha'i wouldn't necessarily indicate that the person was a Baha'i, unless the context and the source are carefully examined. And another example, uh, the other way, is of uh, Sayyid Jamal ad Din. Asad al-Badi or Af al-Afghani who was often described as a Babi in sources from the 19th century onwards but in fact he was although he associated with Azali Babis he wasn't a Babi and he was indeed somewhat antagonistic to both the Baha'is and the Babi religion. So again this is not a someone who's identified as a Babi or Baha'i in Muslim and other sources it's not a infallible criterion it is just a criterion. A third criterion was having descendants who are Baha'is and who assert that their ancestor was a Baha'i. Again, this isn't conclusive because we have the example of, for example, Master Khodar Baksh, who was a leading Zoroastrian of Yazd and whose Baha'i descendants claim their ancestor was a Baha'i, but probably he wasn't. Um, so again, it's not an infallible guide. The fourth is correlative evidence from Baha'i sources for being a Baha'i, such as the writings of the person themselves or their poetry, being member of a local Baha'i council, local spiritual assembly would be prima facie evidence for them being a Baha'i, being in correspondence with or visiting the Baha'i leaders, um, while being, and, and, and again, none of these are in, infallible. If one is definitely, was definitely a member of a local spiritual assembly, that probably is conclusive. But many individuals <coughs> wrote or even visited Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, but weren't Baha'is. And some of those who visited were even antagonistic to the Baha'i faith. So this is not a, an, uh, a definite um, infallible guide, as it were. And lastly, there's similar correlative evidence from Muslim and other sources, such as how the individual treated Baha'is while holding office. But again, this isn't uh, conclusive evidence because good treatment of Baha'is might just indicate that a person's a, hu a humanitarian nature rather than that they were Baha'is. So none of these five criteria I'm suggesting to you are infallible but they all provide indicative evidence and if we get a situation where we've got more than one of these five types of evidence for a single individual then we're starting to build up a a picture of yes this person was probably a Baha'i or and, and, and I must say here that when I say was probably in uh, from this point onwards when I say someone's probably a Baha'i I really mean that he was either a Baha'i or a very close Baha'i sympathizer because we don't know what's going on in people's minds and hearts um, all we can judge is their actions and, and the evidence about them um, so uh, 
difference between a Baha'i and a close sympathizer is very difficult to determine. And unless at some time in the future we gain access to private papers of these people or their correspondence with the Baha'i leaders here in the Haifa Akka area, uh, we're not going to be able to make definitive judgments about whether they were Baha'is or close sympathizers. So from now onwards when I say someone was a Baha'i, I mean was either a Baha'i or a very close sympathizer. So if we look at the range of individuals from across the upper echelons of Ajar society, we find a good many who may have been Baha'is or close sympathizers. And the interesting thing when we look at this this range of people is that they come from a very wide range of political opinions, from conservatives to reformers. You might think that the Baha'is were all from the liberal, reform-minded end of the spectrum, of political spectrum in Iran. But in fact, you find people from both ends of the spectrum who you can identify in this way as Baha'is. There's a wide geographical spread also. So I'm just going to very rapidly go through a number of um, people and I've listed here again those five criteria, one to five because I'm going to sort of just say criterion one and criterion two to avoid having to prolong this too much. If we look first at the question of the Gajar family, the royal family in other words, there are three or four family groups who, where the Baha'i faith seems to have penetrated quite, quite a lot in, in these family groups in, in the Gajar family. Um, there is, for example, Shamsa Jahan Khanum, who was known as Haji Shahzada Khanum, and used the pen name Fetne in her poetry. She was a daughter of the 14th son of Fat Ali Shah, as you know, being a son of Fat Ali Shah was no great distinction in Iran, because there were an awful lot of them, but she was a, a one of the sons of, uh, she, she was the daughter of one of the sons of Fat Ali Shah, and uh, she became a Babi, met Ratul Ain Tahereh, visited Baha'u'llah in both Baghdad and later in Ederne. And we have both criteria one and four for her being a Baha'i. And it is actually a family cluster because her full brother, Muhammad Hashem Mirza, and her half brother, Akmar Mirza, were also Babis for a time and attended Babi meetings in Tehran, we know. Um, although quite what their opinions were later is difficult to say. Akbar Mirza went later on to study under um, Hadish Sabzavari, the famous philosopher, um, and I, I don't think he was then a Baha'i, but uh, it's difficult to say. A second group goes uh, clusters around the descendants of Ziyar Saltaneh, who was regarded as having been the favorite daughter of Fat Ali Shah, and who married Mirza Masood Ansari, Gamrudi, who was the foreign minister during the reign of Muhammad Shah. She wasn't a Babi or a Baha'i, but the daughter of this couple, Arajan Shahzadeh Khanum, uh, Shah and Shah Khanum, um, married uh, and had two daughters, and these three ladies were all Baha'is. Uh, one daughter married Entezamo Saltaneh, who was a Baha'i, and through Entezamo Saltaneh, these three ladies became Baha'is. And um, in fact, one of the two daughters married the prominent Baha'i Ibn, Ibn Astad, uh, who was uh, uh, appointed by Baha'u'llah as one of the hands of the cause. And there are letters from the Baha'i leaders addressed to these three ladies and their descendants. So on criteria one, three, and four, we can say that they almost certainly were Baha'is. And the la uh, and uh, sorry, and one other. Um, Qajar family grouping uh, that sons, descendants of Tahmas Mirza Mu'ayyad al -Dawla. Now, again, he probably wasn't a Babi, although um, he did, in fact, he, he was given a copy of Baha'u'llah's Kitab -e Iran and is reported to have declared that either one had to declare oneself without religion or one had to accept the truth of the author of this book. And after this, he was in contact with and protected one of the Baha'is, Nabil Akbar, for much of the rest of his time as governor of Khorasan. So we've got criteria one and four, but it's difficult to be absolutely sure that he was a Baha'i, but certainly he had a Baha'i, a sister who was a Baha'i, um, and who, uh, well, first of all became a Barbie from meeting uh, Tahereh in Hamadan, and then later uh, a Baha'i. And she had two nep had a nephew 
uh, who was a son of Tahmas Mirza um, and who was definitely I think a Baha'i because he's said to have been converted in Hamadan by Mirza Abul Fazl and along with his son uh, Mu'ayyad uh, al-Saltana they're both called Mu'ayyad al-Saltana one after the other um, and uh, the latter was head of the telegraph department in Esfahan and then Shiraz and during the constitutionalist revolt he sided with Muhammad Ali Shah so this is why I'm saying they're across the political spectrum this family grouping sided with Muhammad Ali Shah and was actually pressed into becoming head of the royal cabinet and after the Shah's defeat he left Iran and went to Acre and met Abdul Baha there and re later returned to Iran and wrote a book of Baha'i proofs so I think there's not much doubt you can say by criteria 1, 3 and 4 these people were Baha'is and lastly there's the question of uh, the famous uh, this time now on the reform end of the spectrum uh, of the Qajar family uh, Haji Sheikh al Rais who was a Qajar prince became a Mujtahid in fact and was a prominent figure in the reform movement and although most Iranian histories ignore all connections between him and the Baha'i faith there's good evidence that he was a Baha'i that he visited Abdul Baha on two occasions that his and you can see in his poetry strong published poetry this is uh, strong allusions to Baha'i themes and that he was also widely acknowledged to be a Baha'i both by his friends and his enemies during his lifetime and I say that this is another family cluster because there's evidence that his mother had been a Baha'i before him so he in fact uh, satisfies four of the five criteria now if we go on to high government officials there is again another cluster another family cluster uh, around the Ghaffari family of Kashan whose most famous member was Amin al who was the minister of court during Nasir Din Shah's reign now he probably wasn't any Babi or Baha'i but his son Mahdi Khan Vazir Humayun who was at first opposed to the Baha'is but then later uh, was converted by two Sufi Baha'is in, uh, in 1904 and after the constitutional revolution although advised by Abdul Baha to be prudent he began to teach the Baha'i faith openly in Tehran then left to visit Abdul Baha in Egypt in early 1910 and this fact was announced in the newspapers and so he satisfies four of the five criteria but also his older brother became a Baha'i because he went with him to visit Abdul Baha um, and um, um, there are other members of the family who w were uh, Baha'is um, there were four there were the, uh, a cousin of these two brothers Ghulam Hussein uh, Amin Khalvat was private secretary Nasir Din Shah and Muzaffar Din Shah he is reported to have accepted the Baha'i faith after a meeting with Nabila Zarandi in 1864 and was in friendly correspondence with Baha'is such as Sadr al-Sudur and closely associated with the Baha'i merchant uh, Muhammad Hussein Tabrizi of Kashan. And that also his brother Iqbal al was friendly to the Baha'i faith during his governorship of Kerman, closely associated with the same Baha'i merchant Muhammad Hussein Tabrizi of Kashan, and with um, uh, another Baha'i although probably um, these two Baha'is I don't think they were fully Baha'is but they were certainly very close sympathizers and from that same Ghaffari family next group is the Entizam or Saltane family who we've already talked about because this was the why uh, this uh, his wife he, he this was the man who converted his wife Agha Shahzad Khanum and um, and also her sister and mother and also his son Mir Sayyid Muhammad uh, Entizam al-Saltana was a Baha'i uh, who was among the entourage of Abdul Baha in, in Paris there's pictures of him with Abdul Baha and he seems to have followed Abdul Baha both in Paris and later in England um, and actually there, there's a relationship there with the Ghaffari family because his, um, he was married to one of the members of that Ghaffari family and these people were prominent people again the, um, uh, they were sons of the Vazir of Tehran and a brother of this Entezama Saltana succeeded Count de Monteforte as the head of the gendarmerie um, 
and so they were uh, again a prominent uh, Ajar family of officials um, yes I've already said this haven't I that uh, he was in the entourage of Abdul Baha uh, in Paris and however there's a, a slight problem within with this Entezam or Sultana family because he, they're also considered to have been Sufis um, uh, they they um, uh, they're listed among the uh, Anjuman al-Khovat, which was a Sufi group uh, in Tehran, and uh, in fact they were very high up in this Sufi order. So uh, there is this question of you know which which of those two did he have the greater allegiance to? <laughs> uh, we uh, at the moment I, I I can't tell because there's ev the strong evidence in both directions. Then there's the members uh, again of uh, a, a, a tribal family, the um, from the Mafi tribe of uh, who were resident in in Bazvin. Um Hussein Ali Khan, a Mafi, Saad al Mot, later Nizam al Sultan. Um, he was governor of various places: Boucher, Zanjan, Khuzestan. Then Minister of Justice and Commerce. Then a Finance Agent for the Crown Crown Prince and briefly Prime Minister. And he protected the Baha'is whenever he was governor. His wife, his private secretary, his tailor and his cook were all Baha'is. So he surrounded himself with Baha'is. And his brother Sa'ad al-Mulk was also um, governor of Boucher and Gulf ports and of Nuristan. And we have both Baha'i sources and British diplomatic sources saying that both of these brothers were Baha'is. Um, and also they have a, a, a cousin who was a Baha'i. So we have, they satisfy at least three of the cri uh, five criteria. In the Bakhtiari tribe, Eskandar Khan Bakhtiari, the uh, son of the uh, chief of the Bakhtiari tribe, Hussein Ali <coughs> Khan, was, is reported to have been converted to the Baha'i faith while both he and Ali Muhammad Varga, a prominent Baha'i, were in prison in, in Esfahan. And we have the additional evidence then that this went through the sort of that high level of the Bakhtiari family group by the fact that his brother Ali Ghali Khan Sardar Assad who was one of the foremost leaders of the constitutional revolution he led the forces that came up to Tehran from the south from Esfahan and took Tehran and overthrew Muhammad Ali Shah to re-establish the constitution um, while he was in France he took on a Baha'i um, as tutor to his children and when they returned to Iran he collaborated with this Baha'i in translating books from French into Persian and later in 1913 he met with Abdul Baha in Paris and entertained him in his own home. And the interesting thing is that uh, thanks to Soli Shahwar's book we know that Alexander Tomansky reported in 1895 that he knew of two Bakhtiari Khans among the sons of Hussein Ali Khan who were Baha'is and the only two I can think of is is these two who have any connection with the Baha'i faith so I'm assuming that that he doesn't name the two unfortunately but I'm assuming that um, this is um, uh, these two people and uh, I'm uh, for, you know I don't want to spend a lot of time on this but there were other members who are very well known figures in Ghajar Iran like the Mustafi al Mamalek, who was state uh, in charge of the state treasury and later prime minister, the e evidence for these individuals is very weak. Uh, so I wouldn't say they were probably Baha'is, but they were certainly sympathisers at least as, at some stage in their lives. Um, th there is evidence for Mustafi al Mamalek, even the well-known prime minister for much of Gaja, uh, for much of Nasser din Shah's reign and part of Muzaffar din Shah's reign. Uh, is said to have been a secret Baha'i in a report from a British consular official but in Baha'i sources he's in correspondence with the Baha'i leadership did act to protect the Baha'is on several occasions but no Baha'i source says that he was actually a Baha'i. Okay what I want to do finally is to look in detail at two individuals and these the reason I've chosen these two individuals is that they are people who know Baha'i or other history claims were Baha'is. So these are two individuals who the Baha'is don't say they're Baha'is. No Iranian history says that they're Baha'is. But I would like to suggest to you that there's a huge amount of evidence that they were either Baha'is or close Baha'i sympathizers. And I've chosen these two because they actually 
spanned the political uh, spectrum. One was a staunch <coughs> conservative, the other eventually sided with the reformers and became a leading member of the reformists. So the first of these is Abu Hussein Mirza Farman Farma. He was a Qajar grandee, he was the brother of Muhammad Shah, he was married to, um, he himself married to one of the Muzaffar ad-Din Shah's daughters and his sister was the Shah's, said to be the Shah's favorite wife. So very close to the highest levels of, of the Qajar um, dynasty. And um, what is the evidence for him being a Baha'i or a close Baha'i sympathizer? Well, we have a lot of evidence. His father appointed a Babi Mullah Ibrahim Mullah Bashi as tutor to Farman Farma and his older brother Abdul Hamid Mirza Nasir al dole while he was governor of Sultanabad. During the governorship of both Farman Farma and his brother in Kerman in the early 1880s and early 90s, the Baha'is, despite having numerous enemies in Kerman, in Kerman they were faced with not just their usual Shi'i Muslim opponents, but they had Sheikhi opponents, the powerful Kerman, uh, Karim Khan Kermani, and they had Azali opponents. So they were, the Baha'is were being hounded on three sides in Kerman, and yet during those governorship of these two brothers, they were, com they were free of problems. So it shows that there was a high level of protection going on. And he surrounded himself with Baha'is. He had his steward was a Baha'i, Muhammad Ali Khan, and the latter's son, Azizullah Mesbah, was his secretary. Later, his steward was another Baha'i, uh, said Nasrullah Khan Akashani. And um, he is known to have attended a fate at the Baha'i Tarbiyat School in Tehran in about 1910. And he sent his children to the Tarbiyat Baha'i schools. And I think very interesting, the most interesting fact of all is that uh, a property that Farman Farma owned in Kerman Shah was rented by a Baha'i and the remains of the Bab were placed there for one or two nights on their way from Iran to Akka in 1898. And when the Baha'is later approached Farman Farma to purchase this property because they regarded it as a uh, holy site, he gave it to them freely without any recompense which again indicates to me that he had very strong sympathies to the Baha'i faith because he wasn't the sort of man who gave things away very easily. In fact, he'd, uh, he's accumulated a huge amount of wealth during his lifetime. So that's the first of these um, uh, people. And, and again, there are people associated with him who uh, were closely associated with the Baha'is. His older brother may well have been a Baha'i. He married the daughter of one of the most active Baha'i women of Rafsanjan while he was governor of Kerman and um, as we know he was taught by a Baha'i tutor when he was a child and one of Farman Farma's sons Firuz Mirza was among the Rajah princes who met Abdul Baha in Paris. So again th there's a family cluster here of people who were closely associated with the Baha'is and some of them may well have been crypto Baha'is, secret Baha'is. The second person I want to talk about is Nasr al-Saltaneh. He, he is from the opposite end of the uh, political spectrum. He held the titles of, um, <coughs> later he was Sepah Salah Azam and he was Prime Minister um, uh, on several occasions after, the, uh, after 1909. He was at the head of the, uh, initially he was on the Shah's side, on Muhammad Ali Shah's side and actually took part in besieging the uh, constitutionalist forces in Tabriz but then he um, really got fed up with the Shah and went over to the to the constitutionalist side and he was in fact at the head of the army that came from the north and occupied Tehran and overthrew Muhammad Ali Shah so both the person heading the army coming from the north and the person heading the uh, army coming from the south to overthrow Muhammad Ali Shah had strong Baha'i connections <laughs> Um, so what are the, what's the evidence for Nasr al-Saltaneh then? Uh, it, it's difficult to know what his earliest connections were because he was part of this Khalat Bari family in, who were the largest an, landowners in the Tonok Abun area um, which was on the border between Mazandaran and Gilan. And there was another very prominent Baha'i from that family, Suleiman et Tonok Abuni. So although there's no direct evidence that these two were in contact, it's possible that he may have had his first contacts um, uh, through this family member. But when we come to 1899, we have much stronger evidence because 
um, <coughs> a Baha'i, Ali Ghali Khan, um, was trying to go to Akka because um, Ali Ghali Khan was uh, the son of this um, uh, previously mentioned the Kalantar of uh, Tehran, who was probably a Baha'i. And this Ali Ghali Khan was his son and a Baha'i, and he was trying to get to Akka because he had learnt English. And at this time, there were uh, American ba people becoming Baha'is, and Abdul Baha needed an English translator in Akka. So he's trying to get to Akka, and he came to Rasht, and because of some uh, political difficulties between Iran and temporary political difficulties between te Iran and Russia at that time, there was a prohibition on anyone leaving the port uh, from e leaving from Gilan to go to Russia, and, and so he was stuck in in Rasht. And he went and he, he report in his memoirs or in his daughter's biography of him, he says that he went to the governor and he whispered in the governor's ear that Abdul Baha needs me in <laughs> Akka and he was issued with a passport to go and no one else could get out of, of, of Gilan at that time. And the British consulate Rash reported that the people of Rash thought that he was a Baha'i, that this man Nasr al-Saltana was a Baha'i. And later we have the French Oriental scholar Nicolas reporting that when he was French consul in Tabriz and this man Nasr al-Saltana was governor of Tabriz at that time, he called on the governor. Now Nicolas was very interested in the Bab and Baha'u'llah and, and had done a huge amount of research and he says the conversation revolved entirely around the Bab with whose doctrines my guests seemed to agree. Now whether Nicolas meant the Bab or Baha'u'llah is difficult to say because he quite frequently interchanged the two but anyway that's that's what he actually writes and again Tono Kabane this Nasr al-Saltana was among those Iranian notables who met Abdul Baha in Paris in 1913 and was in touch with the Baha'is there we know he he was reading some answered questions while he was in in um, in Paris at this time Abdul Baha's book some answered questions because we have his marginal notes from a copy of the book So, <coughs> so basically in conclusion then I've thrown up the vexed question of the nature of religious identity and who can be identified as a Baha'i particularly in these upper echelons of Qajar Iran where it was very difficult for someone to come out and openly say they're a Baha'i and I've identified five criteria no one of which is foolproof but I would suggest that <clears throat> where you've got more than one of these criteria applying to the same person, then we can at least say he was a close Baha'i sympathizer, if not a Baha'i. And I've now given you a large number of individuals, both from the Qajar royal family and um, from the highest echelons of the Qajar administration, who fulfill these criteria. And I've also looked at two individuals who, in fact, haven't been claimed to be Baha'is in any of the usual Iranian and Baha'i histories, and yet if we take a close look at their lives, there is considerable evidence that can be accumulated that they may have been crypto Baha'is. So all in all, what I'm suggesting to you is that there were many Baha'is in the upper strata of Qajar uh, society, and that this factor, and, and that we haven't sufficiently taken account of this in, in examining uh, Qajar history and, and the, the light this might throw on other matters, in, in Rajar history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Momen, for another very interesting uh, presentation and uh, topic that you presented to us, and it's quite uh, novel as, as far as I am concerned, as, as far as my knowledge uh, exceeds. Um, we have uh, questions, please. Well, I think uh, your uh, paper, uh, I mean, your talk, uh, indicates uh, and points and stresses the fact that uh, there are so many fluctuations in mm. the number of Baha'is. Mm. We mm. see from a uh, few uh, tens of thousands of Baha'is to mm. I even encountered something like two million, you know, the, in some of the Russian. Uh, so there is that's, that makes it, I think, uh, representative of this fact that you know not exactly they know mm -hmm. and uh, we can imagine even that uh, or assume 
that even the, the highest number of 2 million, maybe mm. there has been even more than that. So because of these uh, precautions that they mm. had at the time, and, uh, and the same, uh, by the way, goes on for uh, today's Baha'is, I think. Mm. I mean, there is a, um, I mean, I, I'm not in a position to say how many Baha'is are in Iran, but uh, having uh, hearing the same over and over again, the same number of 300,000, it doesn't make sense that, you know, for such a long time we have the same number <laughs> going on. <laughs> um, so uh, there is a um, lot of room for uh, real uh, uh, such a research into mm -hmm. that topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, or maybe I think uh, it would be, uh, I'm not in a position to advise you of course, but mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, assume that uh, it could be, for example, the trying to evaluate the date or the time, mm. more or less, of these people becoming Baha'is. Mm. And then from that, uh, learning about the circumstances that they <coughs> became Baha'is, whether mm. it is because of familiar things mm. or mm. whether it was because of uh, being exposed in the same mm. uh, um, uh, jail with this uh, <laughs> ba other yes. Baha'i. And you know, we, we have examples like that, that mm. some people that were staunch Shiites after a discussion became staunch Baha'is. So uh, the, the, the circumstances, I think it's also uh, very important. Um, anyone else? Yes, yes, please. I had a, qu <coughs> a question concerning, um, you mentioned the Sufi or Balsa and Baha'i. Is that a common combination of religions or is it um, Well, in the Baha'i community, the people who are known Baha'is, as it were, um, there, there are quite a number of Sufis. I, who um, became Baha'is and some of them continued in the sort of Sufi style of being wandering dervishes um, and they actually taught the Baha'i faith and quite a number of people became Baha'is through them including other Sufi dervishes so there was a little bit of movement in that direction going on uh, towards the end of the 19th century and we have uh, you know a number of we can name uh, 10 or 12 individuals who became Baha'is and continued in being Sufi dervishes going around talking to other Sufi dervishes and so on. Um, some, of, some of the Sufi dervishes once they became Baha'is took off the Sufi uh, garb as it were and settled down and, and uh, were no longer Sufi dervishes if you like. So that also happened. And then individuals like the one I spoke about in Tazama Saltanehu and there was other ones. Um, Sadra Sudur was very high in a Sufi order and then became a Baha'i. So there are people who were sort of at the top levels of Sufi orders also who became Baha'is. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned how uh, the last one, Sal Tanev, mm -hmm. Al Sal Tanev, mm. was actually the commander of the forces coming from the north. Yeah. So uh, was he hoping, uh, like, uh, when he was bringing the constitution Reza Khan to power, so was like he hoping Reza Khan would bring uh, more uh, tolerance to the Baha'i community. And no, this was this was the constitutional revolution. That was uh, before Reza Khan. This is this is oh. in 1909. Well, this is 1909 that these two forces oh, right. came oh, yeah, in the constitution just uh, during the constitutional period. Reza Khan was a decade later in 1920s. Um, so it's a, a different time period. Oh, well, okay. So to rephrase my question, was he hoping this constitution would help the Baha'is get more rights or tolerance? Well, the, the Constitution uh, had already been established in 1906 at this time. What happened was the Constitution was established in 1906. Immediately afterwards, Muhammad Ali Shah came to the throne and worked to overthrow it because he didn't want it. So he overthrew the Constitution. And then these two armies, as it were, came from the north and the south and overthrew Muhammad Ali Shah and re-established the Constitution. So that, that's the sequence of events. And certainly when the constitution was being talked about in 1905, 1906, uh, particularly in 1906, there was a great hope among the Baha'is that it would bring freedom to the Baha'is because all of the P all of the key advocates of the constitution were talking about freedom of religion as one of the freedoms that they hoped would come to Iran as a result of it. But in the sort of politicking that went on when the constitution was being established, um, in order to get the popular support for the constitution, they had to rope in a number of the mullahs, leading clerics of Tehran. And these mullahs managed to sort of get 
uh, clauses put in the constitution that then worked against freedom of religion and so therefore the constitution wasn't actually of great help to the Baha'is in the end although initially it was obviously intended to be <coughs> you want it, Michael? Uh, yeah, and <coughs> we're going through the thoughtful analysis first of all. I noticed that there seems to be a lot of based on the dynasty, a lot of probable based on your criteria, um, Baha'is in the upper stra strata. Um, how would you say that compares to the uh, Pahlavi dynasty in terms of where the Baha'is stood in the upper strata as well? Um, the, the situation in the Pahlavi dynasty is different because. Um, at this time, we're talking about in the Qajar dynasty, there was no formal registration of Baha'is. Mm -hmm. So people allied themselves to the Baha'is and took, you know, you could say there was a sort of whole gradation of degree of Baha'iness, if you like. So people were, these, many of these people who are high up in uh, the ranks of Qajar society wouldn't openly associate with the Baha'i community, they wouldn't attend Baha'i meetings or anything like that that would identify them as Baha'i simply because of the, their situation. And so, as I say, it's very difficult to know whether they were Baha'is or not, there was no formal registration of Baha'i. By the time you're talking about the Pahlavi period, by that time the institutionalization of the Baha'i faith had proceeded a great deal and people were actually required to register as Baha'is. So there was a register of the Baha'i community. So it's much easier to say someone is a Baha'i and someone isn't. So in the Qajar period, in the Pahlavi period, <coughs> basically, and, and also there was much in this Qajar period, although at the Baha'i leaders had sort of talked about not getting engaged in politics, particularly in seditious politics and so forth, there were still a number of Baha'is who obviously were in the higher echelons of political matters and so on. But after about 1913, the Baha'i leaders were very much stricter against political involvement of Baha'is. And gradually, one by one, the Baha'is came out of politics and being involved in political matters. So by the time it comes to the Pahlavi period, anyone who considers themselves a Baha'i would not get involved in politics. So there are a number of people who had been Baha'is or came from Baha'i families who then left the Baha'i community and entered into politics. But there was a very different, there was a different, you know, it was a completely different uh, scenario here because you, you've got a definite registered Baha'i community and people who got, in, got involved in politics either had already left the Baha'i community. In some cases, there were children of Baha'is that never even entered the Baha'i community. They had just been children of people who had been Baha'is, or they had been Baha'is but left the Baha'i community and went into politics. Or in some cases, they went into politics and were expelled from the Baha'i community by the Baha'is themselves for their in involvement. So it's a very different um, set of situations comparing the Qajar period with the with the Pahlavi period and, and um, um, yeah very stiff very different Well, for, for some of them, there is very clear evidence. For example, Vazir Humayun had actually been very antagonistic to the Baha'is when he was governor of Zanjan and had a, be had, had a Baha'i beaten and so forth. And then, you know, later on, he's protecting the Baha'is. So you've got a clear, and there's another one uh, of the ones I mentioned who has a similar story of having at one time, you know, beaten Baha'is and, and been against the Baha'is and then later. So there, you can certainly from their actions say that there's been a change in their attitude. 
Uh, as far as writings is concerned, most of these people were not writers. You know, they they, they wrote official reports, but they did. Uh, if we can get access to their private letters, there may be. But even then, it was highly unlikely that a person would put something down in writing that might later be used against them <laughs> if that letter got discovered. So, uh, unless, as I say, uh, the um, things are discovered here in in Haifa Aka area of their correspondence with Abdul Baha or Baha Allah. There, there they might openly say something but if they were writing to other individuals in Iran it's very unlikely they would say anything that would be incriminating I, as a follow up I noticed that in several cases some of these prominent people have surrounded themselves in an immediate sense with a couple of yeah. the secretary yeah. of them and went yeah. to yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Would, would that have been a strategy to yeah. essentially to, to, to contain and to protect themselves as Baha'is Yes, it wouldn't necessarily have been a protection because if if they put too many Baha'is around themselves, that might that might actually lead to yeah. suspicion about them. So, but I think they they uh, you know Baha'is were well known for being trustworthy and so forth as well. So there were there were other reasons also for choosing Baha'is ar to be around them. But even even um, you know Muhammad Ali uh, Shah, while he was governor of. Tabriz surrounded himself with a number of Baha'is so it wasn't unusual um, for people who were sympathetic to the Baha'is to surround themselves with Baha'is but quite what their motives for doing that whether it was just because they were, felt they were trustworthy people or whether they were as it were surrounding themselves but with Baha'is uh, for some other reason is difficult to determine. The, usually the minorities were very more trustworthy mm. than mm. The, the general Shiite population. Mm. And I remember one of the books that I read during the Pahlavi period. It was stated uh, it was about ed education in the higher education in Iran, from person we know, uh, during the Pahlavi period. And it was said there that the only people that could photocopy in the university because there is uh, was a savak person sitting on the photocopy machine and he would actually determine who can photocopy it. The only people that were allowed to photocopy without any problem that were the Jews. Mm -hmm. So this means that you know the, 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 the regime is less suspicious of mm -hmm. the groups that they are, don't have any specific attachment to some outer body or something like that. So it's much easier. Um, Yes, uh, you Professor hinted, Gerbach. and I thank you, thank you for your lecture. You hinted, and I wonder if you uh, would like uh, to elaborate a bit uh, about the political implications or meaning or consequence of the fact that you had uh, relatively uh, all these members of mm -hmm. uh, the, the Bangladesh and the Baha'i faith in the operation of Qajar. Uh, 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 well, this is something that I. I'm doing research on now, so it's a bit premature probably to say too much, but um, certainly um, certain actions, certain events that took place can only really be explained on the basis of Baha'i connections. For example, this Haji Sheikh al Rais that I spoke about in this um, paper, um, he, was, he was elected the um, representative parliament for Sari in Mazandaran. Now he had no connections at all with Sari. Uh, I don't think he'd even ever been there. So how come he was elected the the delegate for Sari? Well, it happens that the Baha'is were actually quite strong in Sari and and were you know uh, h held very powerful positions in Sari. And <coughs> my only conclusion can be that he, he actually was elected because he was a Baha'i uh, for for Sari. Um, the but but much much sort of at a much deeper level. Um, all sorts of things we can we can find hints here and there. For example, in one of the books of, about the constitutional revolution that was written by one of the constitutionalists themselves, who was involved in the whole movement, says that they purposely copied the tactics of the Baha'is in in their uh, in, in in the groups that they made and, and the uh, their activities and so on. In another uh, another example, for example, is that completely out of the blue, one of the uh, demands uh, of the constitutionalists were for the establishment of an Adalat Khane, a House of Justice. Well, House of Justice is a very prominent thing that Baha'u'llah decrees 40 years previously in his 
most holy book, the Kitab al-Aqdas, saying wherever there are enough Baha'is gathered, you should have a house of justice. And, and this phrase, house of justice, I mean, the phrase Baha'is use is Beit al ad and this, house, this was Adalat Khane, but that's just a straightforward translation of Beit al ad into Persian. So, you know, where does this idea of a Adalat Khane come from? That, they, that suddenly became the main demand of the constitutionist at one point in time. Um, you know, again, you know, it's difficult because, you know, you, you and, 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 and in fact, again, a, a piece of research that I'm doing now and I hope to write a paper about is that several of these people who are thought to have been Azalis, um, in other words, the rival of the Baha'is in religious terms, uh, earlier on in their career were actually, I think, Baha'is. People like Malik al Murtakal Lamin and um, uh, Said Ba is an Isfahani and um, uh, Sayyid Asad al is a uh, Isfahani and, and others, I've got fairly strong evidence that they were actually Baha'is earlier when they were in Isfahan and it's only when they came to Tehran and started pushing the constitutional movement forward and associating with other Azalis that they became more closely associated with the Azalis than with the Baha'is. But early in their career, and I think they brought into, the, into this whole discourse about the constitution all of the ideas that they had previously collected from the Baha'is in when they were closely associated with the Baha'i community in Isfahan. Yeah, I think uh, beyond the political aspects, it raises a much fundamental problem, which is the historiography of modern Iran. I mean, uh, almost every aspect that you look at, not using the Baha'i sources, and when you use the Baha'i sources, you will sometimes find a different picture or new facts that haven't been discussed or have been, uh, new reasons that have been taken into consideration. So that, in my view, and I uh, stated that also in the, the book on the schools. This uh, raises a very fundamental issue in the uh, historiography of modern Iran. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, to the extent that you, ha you need to revise the whole thing and uh, to see at least in the, those areas that uh, the Baha'is were prominent. And uh, I think at least uh, four or five major fields we can talk about this. And there is no mention, and we know why it's no mention, but uh, uh, it's a very important issue. Anyway, what I had also to say regarding Farman Pharma, for example, mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned that uh, two or three of his kids were uh, studying in the Tarbiya. Yes. But yes. also a, a book of his uh, daughter. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Satar Farman. Uh, yes, 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 Satar. Yes. 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 There is yes. also very positive ap attitude to the... Baha'is. And uh, you mentioned that the Afnans used to do uh, some, uh, to hold uh, some uh, Shiite religious uh, mm -hmm. procession. Was this also after they became Baha'is? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, yes. Because they were Sayyids. Uh, yes. That's why I thought mm -hmm. because maybe because mm -hmm. of the being Sayyids, mm -hmm. they thought. No, as far as I know, this is after they became uh, yeah. part of Eastern okay. Baha'i. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions? If not, so thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.